Bonjour, uh, bonjour à tout le monde. Uh, welcome everybody. It's very nice to see you today on such a wonderful day, sunny day in Paris. But I'm sure that uh, the the level of reflection and, uh, will be uh, enough to make us travel a lot in this room. We have people coming from uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, China, and France. Um, as you know, the world is changing very fast, and uh, cities are growing even faster, and becoming a world of cities will require investment on a scale never seen before, and that, that is why we are here together to discuss uh, this question, and this panel will look at concrete examples of financial innovations to answer some questions. How will we secure the massive investment needed to support such rapid urbanization? Who will make those investments? What role for public and private finance? finance? Who will measure and carry the risk? That are some of the questions. So uh, our goal is to present you, uh, for each of our speaker, uh, a, a few minutes for each of them, um, the main project they have in mind and what is the main question they, they would like to uh, discuss with you. Uh, they will talk about three minutes each, no more. And we have red flags in, in the room if they go longer, but, uh, and then uh, I will ask them one question and then you will have the possibility to address the, uh, the speakers in order to uh, establish a, a lively discussion. Um, I'm very happy and honored to, uh, to, uh, to give the floor to Lady Barbara Judge, who, is, um, who was appointed the chairman of the UK Pension Protection Fund and was before uh, at the UK Atomic Energy uh, department and she has a, 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 an immense experience in infrastructure and I think uh, she is going to try to answer in a new way to the question who is going to pay for all that and I think she has new ideas to, to talk about. So please welcome Lady Barra Judge. Thank, <laughs> Thank you very much. I know we have just a few minutes but I just want to say when I was chairman of the Atomic Energy Authority I realized that governments at the moment don't have money to pay for infrastructure projects. And uh, more and more that becomes the case. It's a great idea to build a lot of infrastructure projects, but only in the US, where I come from, do they have municipal bonds. Really nowhere else do infrastructure projects pay for themselves. So the UK Pension Protection Fund is basically an insurance company we tax all of the defined benefit plans in the UK and have a fund to run. What we do with our fund, which is at $11 billion at the mo pounds at the moment, is that we run it and when pension plans uh, fall over, that the, the, um, the company goes bankrupt, we insure the pension, uh, as it, uh, which is what it's called, pension protection fund. We give the pensioners the money they might otherwise expect. But while we're doing that, we have to run that money, which is 11 billion pounds now, but is growing quite, quite quickly. And the new idea that we had was that with the help of the UK Treasury, we were going to set up what will be an infrastructure fund run by the pension funds. Now, there are, in there are infrastructure funds in the world, but not very many of them, and they're quite expensive. And the UK recently did an infrastructure, uh, an infrastructure plan which said that we're going to need 500 separate different infrastructure projects. And I'm, and I'm terrible at numbers, so I'm going to look up how much they think it's going to cost. But it's a fair amount of money. Yes, 200 billion they think we need to do 500 infrastructure projects. So what we're trying to do in a short period of time is to get the pension funds to put money, seed capital first, and then to, to build a fund that we can use, we can learn ourselves how to run an infrastructure fund so we don't have to pay the big Macquaries of the world that are out there. We will, pardon me to the Macquarie man who's here. Um, we will know how to do it ourselves and then we will look at infrastructure projects as a way to deal with the pensioners. Now the one issue about that is why would you say that pension funds and pension protection fund, which is an insurance company, should invest in infrastructure? Well the reason is we used to put our money in government bonds, right? And gilts and other things that had reasonable rates of interest and were long term 
because we have long-term liabilities, right? We have to take care of all those pensioners whose pension funds may go bankrupt someday in the future. And the thing about infrastructure is if you think about it, it's asset-backed, it's less risky, it's, co it's correlated to um, interest rates, and it is a fairly safe investment, especially if you have a road or an airport. They don't like it so much for nuclear power plants, but I continue to talk to them about it. But fact is, this is what we're doing. We're raising, the, we're, we're setting it up. We're raising the, the capital to run the thing. We're dealing with the treasury, and then we're going to hire a bunch of infrastructure experts. Anybody here could raise their hand who wants this job. And then we are going to take that money and invest first in UK infrastructure because we, and we've seen it, we've seen other people do it in Australia and in Canada particularly, they have infrastructure funds which are run by the pension funds. Actually, Thames Water was recently, a big slug of it was bought by Ontario teachers recently. The Edinburgh Airport is run by an infrastructure fund. A number of projects have already been run. So we figure we can get into the game, we can lower the fees because there won't be a middleman, and we can have UK pensioners paying for UK assets. So that's our new, we hope, our big idea. That's exciting. Uh, we, we are talking a lot about project bonds instead of, uh, um, <laughs> you know, uh, government bonds. Huh? So it's more like a municipal bond. I mean, the reason w w I come from New York, and I was saying before, the, there was a time when New York City was going to go bankrupt, and there were bonds yeah. issued at that time, municipal bonds, which had long high interest rates and long-term propositions, and people actually funded the return of New York City at that time. Mm -hmm. So we thought that we could do it with respect to the London infrastructure. And, and may I ask you what, what will happen in countries who don't have pension funds or very limited pension funds? We would be very glad. Once we have this working, we think that we can open it to, ev to international pension funds. And because we'll have it working and it'll be low fee, we will invite pen many pension funds into it. And we would be running this money for them on a basis that was very secure, we would do all the due diligence, and they would be investors with us. And you say it's a quite a safe investment, but what would be the, uh, the profit of it? If you invest in, uh, in such a fund, uh, how much would we don't you expect? Know, well, we, we don't know how much we will, what we will be charging, or, and we don't know what we'll be making, but we'll, they'll be backed by assets. So we'll look at the assets, we'll look at our cost of funds. We're only going to leverage two to one. We're not going to be highly leveraged because we can't be because we're a pension fund. And we're going to have an infl um, a rate of return that is competitive. That's what we've been saying, competitive rate of return. Merci, Barbara Judge. Our next guest is coming from New York and Boston. Thomas Green, you are the managing director and head of the uh, infrastructure group, City. Could you tell us, please, what would be your main project today in terms of financing the, the, the future of cities in around the world? What, I, what do you have in mind? Well, picking up on um, Lady Judge's comments, uh, we believe that the U.S. municipal bond market is actually a model that can and should be exported and is exportable to the rest of the globe, and in particular uh, will succeed if uh, both the power, as was mentioned by uh, Minister Clark and also came up in the panel on India, if any of you attended that as I did, um, the power to raise revenue, uh, to collect it, and to create credits that are narrowly defined revenue credits that have a, an investment grade credit worthiness almost innately and inherently as we believe cities, because of their mass, even with um, a, a wide range of both poverty and wealth in each city, we believe there's an inherent credit worthiness to the cities. And the reality is, as Lady Judge mentioned, the national governments are not in a position to, to continue to fund this on their own. Um, in a place like China, where there is a massive wealth opportunity and, and a big effort by the national government, this would be just a complement to that. And I know they have an experiment, a pilot program of three cities. In other countries where the national development banks are really tapped out, um, there is legislation, uh, for example, in Brazil, to uh, re-enable a municipal market at that level targeted to infrastructure projects in cities. And just to give you uh, the U.S. example, which has its problems, I don't come here as uh, you know the U.S. and we're better at all, but that market in the last decade has raised $3.7 trillion for state and local 
mainly urban infrastructure, uh, without support from the federal government on the credits. New York City is the biggest borrower there. They have uh, a general credit of the city, but they also, out of their $91 billion in debt in the city, uh, more than half of that is discrete revenue bond credits. One of them is building a new water tunnel into New York, known as the Third Water Tunnel, that will support New York City even if 10 million more people live there. That project's been going on. You may never have heard of it, but it's been going on for 30 years. It's in phase three. They have 20 billion in dedicated water bonds outstanding against that. So I think it's time to look at that model, not to export anything about the U.S. politics or anything, but just the inherent credit worthiness of um, the mass of people in an urban environment. They can't all pay, but they can pay, in many cases, something. You can, we have graduated what's called block rates uh, in our city, so big industrial users pay more, poor people don't pay much, uh, people in between pay something that's affordable, uh, and they're, they're, they're defined credits that we found. Um, there was a two-year period, I won't bore you with the details, but when the U.S. municipals were allowed to go overseas and sell taxable bonds with a subsidy on the side from the federal government, known as the Build America Bond Program. And we sold a quarter of a trillion dollars as, a, as an industry, not just city. We were the number one bank in that, but we sold a quarter of a trillion dollars of these BAB bonds. We took one city to 17 different cities around the world using our Asian platform, our European platform, our Middle Eastern platform, and there were sovereign wealth funds, there were pension funds, there were insurers all around the world who said, geez, maybe I don't want to own as much of the national government of X. I won't name any <laughs> countries here for obvious reasons, uh, but I, I would love to own the city of wise, you know, revenue bond. Uh, and we, so we think that's a very valuable tool to complement the local bank community, to complement what the um, pension funds can do on, the, on their own, uh, to certainly complement any P3 efforts that have more private capital involvement. So really as an adjunct to, and uh, we think a very large dollar addition to, to the marketplace for funding cities. Thank you very much. And where in the United States is the most critical uh, uh, place uh, for this kind of investment? W which city or wi which area? Well, it's interesting about the market. There are um, approximately 10,000 separate borrowings per year in the U.S. sub-sovereign market. So the, the beauty of it actually is that it is localized and what gets financed is decided very locally and funded locally. Clearly the, uh, the federal highway system was built in the 50s uh, is aging, is falling apart. Um, the, the U.S. Congress does not have the will, the willingness or, um, you know, to raise the federal gas tax that has funded that. So now cities are looking at getting more power away from, so we have the same <laughs> federal local power struggle that everyone else does in, in other countries that are looking at getting the authority to toll the major roads around their cities or to otherwise um, take some measure of control over financing transportation. So I would say transportation is critical. Um, obviously education, K through 12 facilities are, are critical. Those are typically funded off of the general and, and, city and budget. And which city, is, which city in the United States is the most, uh, uh, has the most difficult problem in terms of uh, transportation today? Do well, you if you do uh, traffic analysis, I guess you'd yeah. have to say Chicago and LA and New York. I think Chicago is an in another interesting model because they re recognize the problem. And they've had a number of P3s, the traditional concession model. Some have gone well. The most recent ones have not, known as I won't, the parking meters. We could talk about that. But what, what they just did, with, and actually we were the founding uh, partner with the new mayor, Rahm Emanuel, is create a city-level version of what um, Lady Judge is talking about, which is a Chicago infrastructure trust, uh, which is going to, the, the difficulty for pension funds, and I, I won't purport to know your business, but my understanding is pension funds, insurers, they need liquidity. Each infrastructure project tends to be a bit of a one-off, so they need a vehicle for to make it a prudent investment uh, and to make it a, ultimately a liquid investment, even if it's a long-term investment. And so we, we've formed, uh, ma the mayor has formed and just passed through the city council called the Sh Chicago Infrastructure Trust. It will have public pension money, it will have city money, It'll have city money. Uh, it'll have actually Macquarie money uh, and a few other private uh, investors, no, who wanted to go local and frankly weren't in a position to, to assess by themselves the credit worthiness of the individual projects. The first one is energy efficiency. It's, it's called Retrofit Chicago, and it's the plan is to save um, $20 million a year 
in the city of Chicago's budget by retrofitting the city's facilities and funding the investment from the savings created by reducing the energy costs that are already embedded in the, in the city's budget. Thank you. Uh, from, from Chicago, who is definitely a, a small city compared to the small cities in China, we are going to talk to Li Dongming, who is the uh, general manager of China Development Bank Capital Urban Fund. And I would like to say that for the few of you who do, do not speak Mandarin, you might need this little equipment here to follow the conversation. Um, Mr. Mr. Li Dongming, thank you for being here from Beijing. And um, we, we know there must be uh, huge problems in China uh, about you know, city development. What is your priority today? Uh, well, I see a few of you only do not speak <laughs> Mandarin, so please, let's give us a little time. But I know you speak English too, right? Okay. S no, no, but they, w they will take the time, so. <laughs> We, we need to have some improvement in terms of uh, language education, I think, here. <laughs> Next time when you come back. <laughs> Did you fly directly from Beijing? Yes. 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 Okay, let's see if it works. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 Thank <coughs> 而且是我发现坐在我身边的这个跟我一起来做这样一个演讲的嘉宾 在城市开发的这个业务过程中的最重要的合作伙伴，基本上今天的这个嘉宾的这个结构呢，就涵盖了我在中国做城市开发业务的所有元素，所以很高兴。呃呃，下面允许我介绍一下呃中国的城市开发
，这是一个非常具有挑战性的一个事情。然后我们的城市化过程呢，大概分了这么几个阶段，呃，一个是在上一世上世纪八十年代之前，中国的计划经济阶段，在这个模式下呢，在这个阶段里边呢，中国的城市化进展完全是由政府来推动的，政府进行全国的产业布局，根据它的呃经济发展、工业发展的要求。人为的创造了很多大的城市，这是八十年代之前的一个城市化的一个模式。第二个模式是上世纪八十年代到九十年代这个十年间，中国的一个模式呢，是中国政府意识到，或者中国的经济发展意识到城市发展的重要性，所以就进入了一个粗放的、快速扩张的这么一个阶段。在这个阶段里边，城市边缘极度扩张。但也带来了很多城市发展中的问题，因为一个没有一个好的规划，没有一个好的管理，带来了很多问题。第三个阶段呢，是在呃二十一世纪的头十年，在这个，就是说在上一个阶段产生的问题的背景下，中国政府意识到了这些问题产生，带来所带来的一些混乱，所以呢，进行了政府主导的一个城市化的进展。城市化的扩张，就中国的在那个阶段的城市化进展，主要是由政府来主导推动的，政府的力量非常的强大。从现在开始呢，中国进入了一个由城市运营商来主导城市发展的这么一个阶段，就是说，基本上是由市场化的投资机构，按照市场化的运作模式来推进一个城市的发展。目前这样的一个模式，在中国刚刚刚刚起步。我们现在中国的呃整个城市化的进展的过程中，在融资方面、投融资方面，基本上处于一个过渡期。大部分的政府的城市化的这个融资啊，是由政府来主导的。呃，基本的模式我们叫它呃土地财政加政府平台。这个土地财政呢，就是说中国的土地呃全部属于政府，全部属于国家，所以。为了推进城市化进展，为了解决整个城市化过程中的投融资的问题，地方政府呢就会把这个大量的土地进行这个进行拍卖，拍卖给私人的部门或者拍拍卖给投资部门，从而获得收入来支撑中国的城市化的发展，这是我们叫它土地财政。另外一个是呃呃政府平台，就是政府工具公司，政府为了完成为了满足满足融资的条件。他就会成立一个商业化的公司，这个政这个公司呢是由政府百分之百控股的，来进行一个城市的运作，由这个公司来承担，呃，筹资和投资这样的任务，这是这是叫我们叫它为政府平台。当然，在长期的我们的这个城市发展过程中呢，我们就发现这样的一个模式呢其实是不能持续的，带来很多问题，主要问题有两个，一个呢会导致地方一个城市的规划。变得非常的零散，因为土地都在一个城市发展的初期就被一块一块的卖出去了，为了政府为拿到收入，已经被一块一块的卖出去了，所以导致一个城市的整体规划很难很难得到实施。第二个呢，随着城市化的进展，大家都知道，随着城市化的进展，其实这个一个城市的土地价值是在不断的不断提升的，但是由于很早的时间。政府就把土地卖给了私人部门，所以政府在这过程中呢，并没有得到一个很好的利益，所以也从而使他陷入一个恶性循环，就是不断的卖地，不断的去获得资本进行初期投资，然后又以廉价的价格、比较低廉的价格卖掉土地，再来进行循环投资，这是一个他所陷入的一个问题，陷入的一个困境。然后我们公司的出现，我们公司是叫呃国家开发银行金融公司，简称是 CDBC、CDB Capital。我们公司的出现呢，呃，创造了一个一种商业模式，或者叫创新的一种商业模式，来解决这个刚才所谈到的这些问题。下面我先介绍一下我们公司的背景。我们公司是国家开发银行的全资子公司。国家开发银行呢是中国最大的一个政策性的银行，注册资本金是三千亿人民币。呃，截止到二零一一年底，
我们国家开发银行 CDB 的呃贷款余额超过六万亿人民币，其中外汇贷款余额超过两千五百亿美元。我们是中国最大的外汇贷款银行，也是中国最大的呃基础设施城镇开发的一个呃这一领域的产业银行。因为我经过我们我们发我们分析我们的贷款结构，我们发现我们六万亿的贷款中百分之五十都投向了中国的城镇化，也就是说中国城镇化走到今天离不开开发银行的贷款的支持。但是我们在研究一个城市投融资结构的时候，发现如果只只是提供银行贷款，恐怕解决不了一个城市发展的一个根本问题，融资方面的根本问题，因为很多城市的初期的时候。他所培育的项目，特别是基础设施项目、市政项目，还不不能产生现好的现金流，不能产生好的回报，这个时候是无法来承担一个贷款的风险的。为了解决这个问题呢，我们就成立了国开金融公司 （CDBC） 这个公司。这个公司用直投的方式参与到中国城镇化的建设过程中，直接投资的方式参与到中国城镇化建设过程中。我们通常的模式是，我们跟地方政府。跟地方政府来合作，跟市长先生合作，然后去圈占一个很大的圈占一个一个土地，或者是呃协助一个城市发展一个新的城发展一个新城新区。这个土地通常在十平方公里左右。我们会跟地方政府成立一个市场化的合资公司，以这个合资公司的名义进行这个整体的规划、投资、开发和运营。这里面的所有的投融资的功能，都由这个合资公司来完成，完全就撇开了政府的责任，也撇开了政府的风险。这个公司是个市场化的公司，市场化的平台，但是把这一块土地里面的所有的产业设施都放入到这个公司里来，所有的权利和义务也都放一桌放入这个公司来。政府呢，通过我们长期的运作、长期的投资运作，来获得这个土地升值的一个长期的收益。为了做好一个土地的一个城区的开发，我们我们也非常重视这个区域的产业和民生方面的一个发展。比如说，我们提出产城一体化的理念，就是、说产业的发展和城市的发展必须融为一体，不然的话，这个城市会变成一座空城。同时呢，我们也关注在这个区域的医疗、教育这些环境、这些民生方面的发展。我们跟思科公司合作。做呃发展中国的这个智能城市，我们跟美国的绿色建筑协会合作，发展中国的绿色城市，我们引入了很多国际上的理念，在中国的城镇化进程过程中。当然，我们我们的资金呢，其实来自于多个方面，一方面是我们的自有资金，国开国开行的自有资金，另一方面呢，也来也也有国开行的贷款的支持，同时呢，也有很多的呃投资人。作为以我们作为资产管理人进行基金的投资，我们会募集很多的呃外部市场上的资金，包括国外的资金，进入中国的这个城市化的城市化的这个工程之中。呃，我们现在在做的事情呢，是在全国，我们公司成立三年，这个模式也刚刚开始。现在做的事情是在全国，以我们已经做了三十多个项目，在全国落地。现在我们的事情是希望能够吸引我们全球的好的。好的资源、产业资源、城市化发展资源和还有好的资金、长期的资金，能够进入到中国，能够共同的来分享中国城镇化发展中，呃，所带来的，呃，不断的价值的增长。谢谢各位。谢谢。Merci. Uh, Est-ce que vous pourriez, could you please tell us a little bit more about Uh, you said you are now financing or trying to finance 30 to 40 projects. What is the, uh, the the main one in which city, and what is the smallest one that you are financing? Thank you. Uh, our projects are many. Actually, it can cover the whole of China's main economic development areas, from China's economy, 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 这样的这样的项目非常多，呃，我想给大家介绍一个，可能就北京是大家比较熟悉的
至少听说过的城市，中国的首都。其实在，在在北京这个城市呢，我们也做相关的项目，因为北京的人口现在已经超过两千万了。呃，我住在北京，我每天深受这个交通的困扰，上班很上班需要很长时间，呃，呃，地铁很拥堵，大家生活很不方便，这是一个。这是一个我们遇到的，在城市发展过程中遇到的一个遇到的一个问题，然后我们就有有这样一个设想，因为在北京的周边，在这个当烫的呃周边，有一百八十二个城镇、乡镇，类似于类似于类似于拉德芳斯这个面积，拉德芳斯三平方公里，我们的小城镇也是三到五平方公里，这样的一个位置和这样的一个。区域范围，我们就跟北京市政府合作，做了一个叫“北京小城镇发展基金”，把这一百八十二个城镇全部放到我的这个投资范围和发展范围中来。我们的想法是希望在北京周边建设各有特色的卫星城，帮助来解决北京目前所面临的城市化的问题或者大城市病的问题。每个小城镇，呃，这样三到五平方公里的一个范围，我们赋予它一个主题，包括是产业的主题，也包括是休闲的主题，都有可能。因为北京周边的城镇，呃，也希望各位朋友能够有机会去看，北京周边的城镇非常漂亮，都是有山有水，环境很好，还有很多地方还有温泉，都是很好的环境，而且离北京北京交通也很发达。呃，往外走的交通呢很方便，就是这些小城镇呢可能会成为成为未来的城市居民这个居住或者是生活的一个另外一个选择，尽量来疏解城市中心的这样一些人口的压力，这是我们现在的设想。这个基金的总规模，第一期的规模是两百亿人民币，现在已经开始启动，已经在运作了四个城镇的项目已经在运作了。如果各位朋友感兴趣的话。也我愿意成为你们的介绍人，进入我们的这个基金，或者进入我们具体的项目上去，成为北京的一个，成为北京的投资商。谢谢。Thank you very much. Our last guest is from Paris.、Uh, his name is Christian Sauter. He's the deputy mayor of Paris for economic development、uh, and international attractiveness. So.、Uh, Monsieur le maire, Monsieur le maire adjoint, je ne sais pas comment on dit, mais Christian Sauter, would you tell us what is your priority in Paris today and how do you、uh, see the situation for you in the next five years? Thank you. Next time I speak in French, why not? Yeah. And, but、uh, it will be a pleasure to explain to you in a few minutes that、uh, to, to be a world city in this century, you, you have to invest a lot. And, and this creates、uh, financing problems for which you have uh, uh, classical solutions, but you must also invent uh, uh, new solutions. Classi classical solutions,、uh, the budget of the city of Paris, which is, and when I speak about the city of Paris, I'm sorry for Shanghai, this is only 2.2 million inhabitants, you know, but I will refer to the greater Paris, 12 million inhabitants. This is a、uh, this is small and medium city、uh, by comparison to <laughs> to Shanghai. But anyway, so we have、uh, roughly a budget of around 7.5 billion euros every year, and out of this budget, we save money and we plan to and we manage to invest 1.1.5 billion euros、uh, b borrowing part of this money from the market. What we are doing with this、uh, classical way of、uh, financing, we we pay for investments in、uh, public transportation. All the cities have public transportation、uh, problems, and you have to expand public transportation to reduce uh, private uh, automobile uh, circulation. We、uh, spend also a lot of money on. Social housing, because the price of land is going up in most、uh, cities, and this creates a problem for many、uh, citizens. And I will insist on it very rapidly. We spend a lot of money on innovation.、Uh, out of this、uh, 
uh, of this budget, we will invest on six years one billion euro on research, universities, and innovation. Because we think that uh, the key of uh, uh, competitiveness, attractiveness, even a quality of life in the future, uh, also employment uh, situation, the key is uh, innovation. But this is not enough. We have to find uh, private money. And we do it with the long French uh, tradition, which uh, may surprise uh, uh, some of you, of public-private partnership. And I give you uh, five examples. The first one, I spoke about innovation. The, the previous government from the state decided to create cluster, like in California or in Japan, and why not uh, in China, with uh, uh, sharing expense between the private sector paying 50%, the state paying 25%, and the local authorities, including Terry, paying uh, uh, 25%. We built all together um, seven clusters uh, in uh, information technologies, in biotechnologies, in uh, green tech, in finance, finance uh, innovation, in automobile industry, in uh, air airspace uh, industry. And this is a very powerful uh, uh, means to make public and private money cooperating for cooperative research. And cooperative research is quite uh, efficient from the, the Japanese or the American or the French uh, uh, experience. This is one, one example. Second, second example, uh, we have in, uh, in Paris uh, new systems of transportation. You can rent a bicycle at the corner of the street. This is a, this is a, uh, a public ID. This is a purely private uh, uh, enterprises. This is Deco, and it not only doesn't cost to, to Paris, but we, we, we make income uh, out of it. So you see a private company innovating on uh, Paris territory, and many mayors from other cities are coming and see how it works. We have the same system now, uh, much more recently, for electric cars. You can take an electric car in Opera and drop it in, uh, in Champs-Élysées uh, very easily. This is also a purely, uh, few, a purely private, uh, private uh, uh, venture. Another example uh, on the green tech. We have, we have uh, like many cities in the world, uh, a climate plan to reduce uh, drastically the energy consumption uh, of and the carbon emissions by 25% between 2004 and 2020. But uh, to show the, the way, we have a program with the Clinton Foundation providing uh, financial uh, engineering to make energy efficient 100 schools a year and 4,500 uh, social housing uh, a year, you see. So we combine, we combine uh, uh, public, uh, public initiative and uh, private, uh, private uh, know-how. Another example, we have, like in uh, Hong Kong, we have new territory. We are developing new territories inside Paris and obviously much more in Paris, uh, in greater Paris uh, region. I, uh, on this, we, we sell public land like you do. We sell public land uh, to private companies uh, by auction, and they compete for that, uh, French and uh, European and uh, fully foreign uh, companies. And with, the, with the, the money we make out of the sale of the, the, uh, the sale of the land, we built uh, social uh, equipment, uh, uh, green parks, uh, and, uh, and so on. So this is a combination of public initiative and private, uh, private finance. And I think it's quite profitable to invest in Paris uh, uh, real estate uh, development. Last example, and I stop there, we, we have uh, for the greater Paris, we have a new scheme uh, which was uh, uh, induced by the state of a public transportation system, a highway 
a high speed uh, subway system. This is roughly 30 billion euros of investment on 15 years. The state will pay part of it, the, the local authorities will pay part of it, and the customers will pay, uh, will pay part of it. This is also uh, a scheme where we work with private companies for the, for the, the future of uh, Paris and of Paris uh, region. My, my feeling is that uh, you, can, you can convince people uh, that long-term profitability, not, not a day-to-day -day profitability, long-term profitability and job creation, they go together. And that on the long term, for an uh, insurance company, for pension funds, uh, French or Canadian or British, this is, this is profitable because this is a, uh, an investment with very low risk and fair return. This is profitable to invest in the future of a world uh, city. Merci beaucoup. I was going to ask you where do you find new territories in Paris? We can see them in China where they are outside the cities, but where in Paris do you find them? It seems to be a very crowded city. No, 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 no. I, I will take you for a visit. We have a wonderful uh, railway tracks which are uh, absolutely uh, uh, without any use now. And we, are, we will build two, two million square meters of uh, office space by 2020. Uh, adding 2 million square meters to the 16 uh, million square meters existing now. So contrary to what you think, because you travel too much, uh, co uh, <laughs> contrary of what you think, there, are th there is a lot of space in Paris and there are many companies, uh, German, British, uh, American, uh, Swiss, which are developing these new territories and making uh, Paris a very lively uh, and dynamic city. As, as I say often, Paris is wonderful for leisure, but I want you to be convinced that Paris is wonderful for business. Thank you, and it is profitable, he said, okay? So <laughs> anyway, thank you very much uh, all to all the panelists. I think it's time to, uh, to see what you have to say, and so I'm going to uh, give you the floor, and please, I would like to ask you to, to tell us who you are and who you represent, if you can, so we can uh, have uh, as much uh, information as possible. So there is one question here, please. Greg Hummel from uh, uh, Brian Cave in Chicago. I appreciate the nod to public finance. The question of the new infrastructure trust in Chicago, uh, a framework for that investment. I've been trying to get behind what those next projects are going to be, but the, uh, hearing about districts that concentrate a clustering opportunity it will, it, it seems to me infrastructure needs to move beyond just the project and, and, and somehow affect then the, the economy in the district in question. Can you shed some light on what the framework for the infrastructure trust might be? Well, I th it is definitely still in formation, but I think one thing that's interesting to me about it in terms of the forms of P3s that have taken place previously in the U.S., they've been single project. Some have worked, some haven't. I understand in Chicago that's there are many controversial ones, uh, but there's a few that have certainly succeeded for the government. They may be a, a burden on the private sector now if you look at the Skyway. But the thing about that is to, is to try to take, and I think Lady Judge's project may be similar, to try to take um, the private participation, private investment, involvement in the urban needs away from just a single project tender, single concession, and really bring together, as you know, the governance will be both city uh, and also private in terms of advisory roles. And to have uh, sitting at the table and forming and running the governance on a joint, the governance itself being a public-private partnership. And it sounds like from the deputy mayor that is uh, in effect what has been done in Paris on several of these projects. That would be somewhat new in the United States at the sub-sovereign level um, where, where it's needed. So we'll have um, the pension funds, we'll have the city, We'll have potentially outside infrastructure funds from both city and other investment banks. We'll have, um, you know, some formal uh, international infrastructure funds um, involved. And then the project selection, there'll also be debt. Underneath, one of the issues with the P3 is the equity in particular was very expensive even in the good days, and now it's extremely expensive. And the debt cannot be structured um, for the senior debt 
in the way, and we actually did the debt on the Skyway at Citigroup, and we did 1.4 billion in long-term bonds uh, using what are called accretion swaps to create a fixed rate structure and using a AAA bond insurance policy for the life of the deal. Now, obviously, you can't, there is no bond insurance market. There's nobody, no bank post Basel III is gonna write a 50-year swap. Uh, because the capital that you have to put against that is totally prohibitive. So the models don't work that existed for P3s. The project-specific models are very expensive, which is why the UK and other countries are looking at how to partner with these players directly. Uh, and so there'll be debt opportunities, there'll be equity opportunities, there'll be senior, there'll be subordinate. And I think picking the first projects right out of the box, making sure they work, you know, is a critical, particularly given the you know, up and down history in Chicago. And that's why energy efficiency we've done. We just did something called sustainable energy utility in Delaware, very small state in the United States, but basically working with the private sector more than the government. We brought in energy service companies. Um, they are guaranteeing to the state of Delaware that on these different projects, there will be a minimum amount of energy savings in the operating budget of the state. And again, that state's smaller than most cities, so I think it's still relevant. Uh, and that uh, we then sold the capital in the public capital markets, 30-year fixed rate debt, against the future savings with the private sector, you know, and, and the government serving more as a credit enhancer and the private sector taking the risk that they would in fact deliver the energy efficiency savings through, you know, uh, performance guarantees. So that's the kind of model I think will work and succeed on the sh first set of Chicago Thank you. projects. Sorry. Thank you very much. We have a question here. I would like to ask to our Chinese uh, friend here just one question to be uh, more specific about the uh, you know, raising fund in China. Is it state, uh, city, and uh, uh, local fund, but is it also private funding, or is it mainly state funding or public funding, or do you have also private funding, and, and what is private funding for you today? Yeah,我们的这个业务过程中，我们的资金来源非常多元化。呃，在我们这模式之下呢，呃，我们的资金来源基本上不来自，基本上不来自于政府，而是完全是来自于社会资金。这社会资金有几个渠道，呃，一个呢，我们
you, I give you my name card, and I send you a lot of information about that, you see? But, but it comes from law. It doesn't come from local, local uh, practice of one city, you know? Most of the cities are acting the same way, and, and many, uh, many public utilities are partly public, partly private, and the French experience is that uh, it works pretty well because it has the long-term horizon of the public uh, aspect, but also the efficiency uh, uh, system of the private companies. Thank you. Sir, over there, please. Hi, my name is Lawrence Jones with Alstom. I have a quick, uh, two quick questions. The first one, uh, there seems to be a lot of discussion about making investments in major cities uh, like Paris and, and New York. Uh, but what about investing in, in smaller communities? Uh, what kinds of uh, uh, measures are you taking to sort of uh, make investments in those communities? And what would be the, what would be the sort of a, the key um, distinguishing characteristics of uh, investing in a smaller city uh, or in a rural community as opposed to uh, as opposed to in the big cities. And the reason I ask the question is because as much as we talk about, about urbanization, I think we also need to be very careful about over-urbanization. Over and we don't want to depopulate the rural areas. So, so how are you going to sort of attract people to come back to the rural areas? And then my last question, can you just talk a little bit about risk mitigation, uh, even investing in Paris, for example, where you have a huge mobility of people? How do you manage risk in terms of losing tax dollars, for example? Thank you. Maybe Judge would like to start to answer. Okay. Well, the first question is about smaller cities. I think the question is, is there going to be an infrastructure asset that you can invest in? We, if you have a hospital, if you have a road, if you have a school, if you have a big asset which will generate revenue, it doesn't matter whether it's in Paris or it's in Leeds. If you're in... Um, in in France, be, it used to be that there were nuclear power plants, which is what I know about, in lots of small, uh, near very small cities in Paris, and they were often financed by the government. I don't. I think the idea in the UK wouldn't be to concentrate just in London. It would be, in fact, to help to all the urban centres in Leeds and Birmingham, and um, they were talking about Liverpool before. So I don't think that's a problem. I think what we want to do is invest in profitable projects. The idea is to have a long-term, stable investment for our pensioners. After all, they're the owners of the pension funds, which will also help the government because they don't have any money to build them. So I don't think it's a question of big against small. It's a question of profitable, good projects. With respect to risk mitigation, that's a real question. We are going to have to learn how to deal with the risk ourselves because we're not going to have the fund manager in between us and the project. But I think that's what every today, risk has become a very important thing in everybody's company. All of a sudden, the risk manager is a very important person. Every board of directors has to have a risk committee. So I think that what's happened in the 21st century is that risk has come to the top of the agenda and it will be there with us too. Tom, would you like to add something? Just to add to that in terms of the um, smaller community and how to finance that, what is done um, in a number of countries and, uh, and certainly in the U.S. municipal bond market as well is a pooling mechanism and in sanitation and clean water is one example where there's each state has a state revolving fund and, for example, I'm the banker to the state of Michigan's state revolving fund, and it has four to 500 loans outstanding, not just to its big cities, but to very small communities, some of which do not even have their own credit rating at all. Uh, and the state uh, puts in seed capital, provides a subsidized loan rate so that those small communities which have to have clean water, have to deal with sanitation, are borrowing 30 years fixed rate at a rate under 2% in terms of the cost of funds. Uh, and the subsidy is essentially provided by a combination of state and the U.S. national government for just a proportion. The risk management is done by the Environmental uh, Protection Agency of each state, not, it, it's actually federal EPA rules, but as local as possible, each project is looked at. Is it really needed for clean water, sanitation, et cetera, and, and, and does it comply, if you will? And then in many states, there's a, 
uh, financial manager law that allows if a, if a locality goes haywire and, and, and the bonds are at risk or the finances of the locality uh, are leading it towards a bankruptcy, then um, the, each state is empowered to step in, not to take over the city, but to put in a manager to make hard decisions. This is going on in Detroit right now, which as somebody mentioned on an earlier panel, you know, is a, an absolute meltdown of a situation inside the city and the state of Michigan has a financial manager in place on that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, just a, a small word, Christian, to talk about this question. Yes, just a, sw a small word. What is important in a specific urban district or in a rural district is to find taxpayers. I mean, what is the most important is to create new companies and to help people from this district, young people and maybe not so young people, to create companies. Uh, there is a wool, wool field of experience in France and in many other countries on macrofinance. You must combine uh, non-governmental uh, organizations' uh, uh, expertise because the state or the city cannot find the entrepreneur, you know, but the local networks, they can find the entrepreneur and to help them to create real projects and to find finance for their, uh, for their project. This is very important. And I think that's the key for uh, renaissance of uh, uh, dist uh, districts uh, uh, in, uh, in trouble. We have some experience in France. I won't say we are the best. Uh, Quebec is better than we are. But and, and some other country, but I think before investing in public, in public uh, investment, you must invest in uh, human investment and entrepreneur. This is very important for me. Merci. Nous avons une question. Maxime, Maxime Barkat, I'm a private equity investor in real estate. Uh, I'd like to ask you: in, in France, there is a lack of one million housing. Uh, but still they're not being built because uh, there's no solvability. Uh, people cannot afford to buy a house. Uh, so basically this is bringing a lot of money out of the government to subsidize housing and to build social housing. I'd like to know, uh, so basically we are subsidizing money to pay uh, for the landlords because the, the price of the land is going up. So we need to have public money to go to pay for the land at the, at the market price and to build social housing. Uh, what initiatives uh, do you see internationally to keep prices of the land down so that the population can afford housing? And so that money that's being put into so social housing can be put into maybe more productive uh, investments. Who would like to address this question? <laughs> Allez-y, Christian. Oui. Ah, just I mean, in France, uh, I no, know no, no, the no, no, no problem. Your question is very clear. Uh, I take the French example, but this is a, a global city summit, you see. But I take the French example. The new president, uh, François Hollande, who will be uh, in charge uh, tomorrow, you know, uh, has suggested that the state has a lot of land, you know, uh, without any use. If this land in Paris and in other places is given to local authorities to build social program, uh, it, it will be uh, uh, one way to create all the social housing, uh, low cost or medium cost uh, social housing, which is, uh, which is uh, necessary. Otherwise, the question of the price of land is very complicated. Maybe it has been solved in Shanghai, but in Paris it is not. Merci. Uh, uh, do you have any idea in China about that, that question? In China, this question will be more difficult because of the number of people in China. The land is very small. In China, we are also building a lot of land to build a lot of land. We call it a land to build a lot of land. The most important thing is that we will invite the owners of the owners 在建造、在开发一个一个小区的时候，必须有一定量比例的廉价房要造出来，比配比一定比例的廉价房。这样呢，其实呃不会在土地价格上或者在这个这个呃房屋价格上做出什么变动，呃不会给政府造成太大的负担，但是呢也能解决
呃，廉价房的这种廉租房的这个一个保障房的一个建设问题，这个成本其实转嫁给了开发商，或者转嫁了能买得起房子的人，相当于一个社会的我们我个人认为相当于一个社会资源的社会财富的再分配，嗯，这是我们解决问题的一个目前解决问题的一个方式，谢谢。Okay, we have ten more minutes. So, we, how many more questions do we have? So, let's make it one, two, and then we will see first, sir, and then the lady behind you. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Hi, my name is Rosnik Baladin. Uh, I'm with Bliss Capital. It's a Beirut-based uh, Middle East investment-focused uh, private equity firm. And one of my questions, and we don't invest in infrastructure, so I'm just curious about it uh, because uh, globally, the flow of funds has always been from developed economies into the so from the developing economies into the developed economies because of the security of the investment over time. Yeah, however, that flow we see is changing, but not so much yet on the infrastructure side. Um, and if we look at the panel, we've got you know gentlemen from the U.S., England, France, and China. I would say you know three developed economies and one de what we consider developing eco uh, developing economy. Yeah, yet there's different. a lot of examples of developing economies that do not have a history of being actually the safest places to invest in. An example right now is Argentina, who just nationalized an oil company no more than two weeks ago. The question to the audience is, how do you go into investing into infrastructure? Because if we look at what we saw this morning is a lot of the urban cities that are coming up in the, in the years to come are going to be in these countries, in these uh, developing countries. How do you go about investing in infrastructure? which typically has already a yield lower than a traditional investment. And if you add the political risk to it, it even becomes lower. And thereby, how would you attract investors into that sector? I mean, Marian Tom, maybe you've got some experience in that you can enlighten us with. Thanks. Okay, let's see what the question is over there to see if it's related or not. The lady behind you. No, that's okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Go ahead. You? Please. Uh, it's me? No, no, no. Oh, oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> he will be next. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So, um, I, my name is Ruth Dobson. I'm from an NGO that works with um, migrant and slum communities uh, in developing countries. So, um, I was actually going to ask um, whether the panel has any ideas or experience of models that would work for the development of infrastructure in developing countries. Um, the stats on this say that one third of um, the global population will be living in some kind, kind, some kind of slum community within the next several decades. So infrastructure for those communities is uh, extremely critical. Um, a lot of what I've heard seems to apply to more of the kind of developed markets. So I'm interested in any ideas that apply to develop m much more the kind of developing uh, and uh, less uh, formalized communities. Tom, would you like to start? In terms of the um, political risk, obviously that's a, a huge issue and I wouldn't address it in Argentina <laughs> this particular week, but I, I think it's, it's clear that um, what we've found, um, and we certainly are involved in infrastructure projects in countries that have political risk, uh, is the more localized and defined the credit stream um, y you can make the credit. Um, the co a co-investment situation where the government is also involved uh, in the credit, uh, and you know, in some cases, you can actually get some form of multinational, you know, political risk insurance or, or some other, uh, as well as export credit. There's a bunch of vehicles that you can use to enhance the credit worthiness of the project. But I think um, kind of the counterpoint to your question is, well, it's true. Um, this has not been prominent uh, historically. That doesn't mean it's a bad idea or can't work. And the fact that Moody's has for example, one of the bond rating agencies, tens of thousands of ratings on little cities and, and villages in the United States and only 300 bond ratings on sub-sovereigns in the rest of the world is a shame and it's, 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 it shouldn't be that way. And I think it's our job at firms like City, where we operate in 160 countries. It's the job of the pension fund industry, uh, which has tens of trillions of dollars in defined benefit pension plans and the OECD company, uh, countries and not enough places to find investments and we know where the world is going, we're, that's what we're hearing about for three days, but we all know it, I is to put um, this type of model to use. You do need the legal framework to your questions um, you, and uh, Brazil has to reauthorize what they had 
banned for a while, which is local government borrowing, and they're trying to do it in a way that doesn't repeat the mistakes of the past, which were not expropriation, they were over leverage. Um, but uh, I think there's a lot that can be done um, to give investors assurance uh, by the nature of the legal framework locally. And any more specific advice for the next part of the question here on the ONG, NGO, uh, what, what do you do about slums, basically? Well, again, I think, I think um, you know, that, that's, uh, our view is to create, um, and this was an issue in the U.S. actually for a while, where cities were defined verily, very narrowly. Um, um, the suburbs became the areas of growth, which were actually the wealth. Uh, and it became what, what I called back in the 80s when I started in this was the donut effect, where the center city, even though it was the hub on the business side, was rapidly becoming poor or uninhabited after 6 p.m. at night, and nobody lived there. And so what you saw was some fairly courageous uh, political integration. You take uh, Mayor uh, Luger when he was mayor um, in Indianapolis, call, uh, did something called UniGov back in the 70s, and combined Indianapolis with all of Marion County around it and created a creditworthiness. And then they worked with the private sector, uh, the Simon Company, which is a big mall developer in the U.S., uh, Eli Lilly, a big pharma company. They cared about the, ta the city. They cared about the poor in the city. And they did a private-public partnership to invest downtown, bring people downtown, and to have credits in water and sewer and the utilities, uh, other utilities areas uh, and transport um, that that um, charge not only the people living in the slum, but everyone in the in the nice communities and the gated communities, and spread the cost and, and maintain the infrastructure. That will take a massive political change in places like India, where cities right now outside of Delhi don't have that type of power. Lady Judge, you wanted to ask something, to uh, add something. Uh, I just no? wanted to say, but it's not on the same scale. But in Philadelphia. There used to be by the waterfront a really horrible area, which was ironically called Society Hill. Um, and what they did to clean that up was that they essentially gave away the old dilapidated houses to anybody who would pay a minimum, like $500 for them. But they had to promise to do them up to a certain standard so that they would take, essentially, get, it was rather like the homesteading in America many years ago. And now Society Hill is one of the nicest parts of Philadelphia and very expensive. So the people that took the risks early on were not the pension funds, were not Citibank, were people like us who um, invested in the slums and made them beautiful. Okay, we have a question here. And before you ask a question, Tom, we, you said you were in 160 countries. Which country is the most promis uh, promising country for investment in that type of... Uh, for the sub-sovereign? Yes. Um, well, I guess where we're seeing activity, whether they <laughs> live up to the promise, I don't know. We're seeing a number of uh, Eastern European countries looking at this. Um, like, like what? Uh, Poland, for example, is looking at this for some of their major cities. We're seeing, uh, I mentioned Brazil already. Um, India had a couple of fits and starts. There was something like what I described in the water and sanitation area, the Tamil Nadu uh, Development Fund, which actually was modeled on this, ma this US SRF program did make some important sanitation and clean water investments, got caught in the politics. If any of you were in the India session, you know what I'm talking about between the cities and the states and, and the national government. But you know, I think they need to look, look at that as well. And I think that the sheer demand there uh, okay. will, will lead to uh, you know, India taking this on. OK, thank you. Uh, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Monsieur, Fusa, uh, Monsieur Gosa, for giving the, uh, for giving for giving me the chance to ask the last question. As you know it very well, the China-EU Urbanization Partnership was launched at the beginning of this month in Brussels. And uh, I was trying to ask in the spirit of this new partnership, could I ask uh, all the panelists uh, to brainstorm, to improvise uh, like a possible cooperation opportunities between Chinese banker, American banker, a UK fund uh, uh, president, and uh, Mayor, our extremely European city. Okay, uh, maybe uh, Christian Sauter would like to start on that. Um, well, I didn't get fully your, your, the, your there question. There was a uh, European Chinese partnership which was launched last week in Brussels, yes. Yes. and she was asking uh, how you could uh, see a some contribution on that oh, from, from countries like France, I guess. Well, uh, for example, uh, 
I think two years ago, the French president and the Chinese president decided to create a 500 uh, million euro fund to help uh, small and medium companies from, uh, from both countries to invest uh, the other way. And uh, I think in France it created quite uh, excitement from uh, uh, small and medium, uh, highly uh, performing companies to go and invest in Shanghai or in Beijing or in other cities. And, and uh, being from Paris, we have a specialist, uh, Ma Jingjing, uh, uh, both uh, Chinese and France, and we are welcoming small and medium uh, Chinese companies to invest uh, in Paris, in Paris region, or uh, in Paris in France. This is a, pr a practical example. I think, j just, just one word, I think that we should, we should say again, small is beautiful. White elephants, this is finished. This has costed too much money to, uh, to taxpayers and to, and to many private companies. We should, we should have a bottom-up uh, uh, economic development, so everything we can do for uh, small and medium Chinese companies, uh, highly performing companies, uh, to invest in Europe, this would be wonderful. And the other way, the same. And we should work more with NGO to, to find those small and medium seeds of economic development, uh, most uh, civil servants or uh, uh, men of and women of the World Bank, they cannot see them. They are too small, you know. They have big glasses, but you, they, cannot sme they cannot see the small projects. You see? Thank you. Uh, anybody would like to add on that, a comment? Maybe 应该可以在不长的时间内可以进行中国和欧盟之间的这样的一个经济交流以经济实体投资来推动两国之间的城市的发展人民生活水平的提高谢谢Well, that probably is a very good conclusion So I would like to thank you all the panelists and a big bravo for them and thank you to the audience too Thank you very much <laughs>